Tonight's topic is the art of service. Um, when I was looking through my, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, George left me file cabinets full of information. Some of it is his handwriting and some of it is uh, typed. And he was so organized. I love this about him. Everything is like categorized in a little, this is about humanity. This is about service. And so it's like I just have to go through the files. But it's such an, a daunting task. And then even inside the folders, there's so much information to try to squeeze it down to something simplified um, is a challenge in itself. So what I've been wanting to do is being able to use his information as a foundation, but then stem off of it and add updated, because a lot of his writing is 79, 80s, early 90s. So it hasn't really been um, connected to the information highway that we all experience today. So I've been updating it and having a little bit of fun with it, a little guilt, because I don't want to use his stuff and rewrite it, but I am. So <laughs> at that, and that's what he wanted me to do. So I, I don't have any, really, I don't have any guilt over that. But we thought about, I thought about the idea of service. I know he did um, a couple of study groups, lessons on service, and I know he did do some workshops on service. So. By no means I don't want to disregard what he said, I just wanted to add my own two cents in here. And I call it the lost art of service because what I experience is the service industry nowadays doesn't have the same flair it had when I was growing up. Now I've never worked in the service industry, I've always worked, um, somehow I've always managed to work like in factories or the print shops so I ne or on my own. I've always pretty much worked for myself. So being in a place of service is unique for me in the economy world. But for nonprofit, I've had nonprofit my whole life. I've been volunteering since yay high, and so it's always been a part of my life. So that aspect of service I understand. <clears throat> I came across this quote by Gandhi. He says, consciously or unconsciously, every one of us does render some service or another. If we cultivate the habit of doing this service deliberately, our desire for service will steadily grow, and it will make not only for our own happiness, but that of the world at large. And I think that's an accurate saying, that service really is about the world at large. It's not about me. If I make service about myself, then I'm, it's almost like I'm tainting or polluting the action of service. Well, so what, what I thought about is, through the years of service, I have this picture of what service is, but I'm not sure that's actually the same picture everyone else carries. So I thought I would go to the dictionary to see what the definition of service is. I was blown away by the amount of information they have just for the word service. So I'm going to share some of it with you. It says, number one, the action of helping or doing work for someone. For example, millions are involved in voluntary service. An act of assistance assistance or advice given to customers during and after the sale of goods. So, you know, the customer service that you would receive in a um, store. <laughs> the action or processing of serving food and drinks to customers, which we call them servers. The waitress and waitresses are now called servers. Uh, the sh it's short for service charge. So sometimes service means it's a service charge that you would have like your final bill. Service could be a period of employment with a company or an organization. Employment as a servant. And when I thought about that, I thought of um, one of George's favorite movies was A New Leaf with Walter Matthau and Elaine May, I think her name was. Is that, do you remember if that's her name, Mike? You know, it's a short little movie, it's a cute movie. Um, he's this wealthy gentleman who's about to lose all his money, so he has like 30 days, he borrows $50,000 from his uncle and he has 30 days to marry a wealthy woman to pay off his debts and then live off of her. That's the premise. So that's Walter Matthau. He does a great job in this movie, a little conceited butthead. Am I allowed to say that? I just did. So he really is a really conceited little arrogant man and he has a butler. And at um, a point in the movie where he realizes he's about to lose everything, the butler says, um, well, I just want to let you know I'm giving you my two weeks notice and we're about to run, the electricity could be turned off any moment and here's my two weeks notice. And so he convinces, the butler convinces Walter Matho to marry because he wanted to be a single bachelor for the rest of his life and the butler says, no, you should marry her. 
And it, the plot thickens because Walter Matthau decides to marry someone and then kill her just so he can have the money. <laughs> it's really a comedy. <laughs> but, and the woman he picks is just the funniest little woman who's socially inept and has no grace whatsoever, but is just loaded. So it's a really funny comedy about that. He doesn't kill her, by the way. He ends up falling in love with her. But the service, this is what I was thinking about service. He said, um, uh, you've upholds traditions, let me see if I can remember this, you've old, upholds traditions long since gone since your father's error, and not to be selfish, but there isn't much need for a gentleman's gentleman anymore, so please marry the woman so I can have a job, essentially what the butler was saying. But we don't have butlers too much anymore. Maybe some of the wealthy individuals do, but butlers aren't really a big thing anymore. Or if they are a butler, they might have the butler slash cook slash mechanic slash chauffeur involved. It's kind of all together. <clears throat> so that's what I was thinking on employment of a server. And then also in service, it is the use that can be made of a machine. The computer should provide good service for you for years. A period of routine inspection and maintenance of vehicle or of a, another vehicle. So you take a car in for, to be serviced. Uh, services like the armed forces. Uh, services, uh, parking besides a major road supply, gas station, refreshments, you know, when you go to the service stations. That was what we call services. It's a system supplying public need as a transport, communications, or utilities, such as electricity or water. The public department organization run by a government, so U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, the United States Department Postal Service is what it's called, the Secret Service. I don't know why it's called the Secret Service, everybody knows about it, but it's the Secret Service. So that would be a branch of government. Service could also be a ceremony of a religious worship. I'm going to service. I'm going to the 10 o'clock service. Or the funeral service. That's another word they can use it. It's a set of matching dishes and utensils used for a particular meal, like the dinner service. Like, I know we call it a dining set now, but like a dinner service would come into play. In tennis, that's called serving, when you have service. Is that right, Mike? Um, law, the formal delivery of a document, like when you were served, a summons, a written document. So that's a serve. You have just been served. So that's the definition of service. Now... When I was looking through this, I thought, okay, well, because I came up with the different pictures or different aspects of service, I went to Wikipedia to see what they had to say. <laughs> they had more information than the dictionary. <laughs> so what Wikipedia did is they actually broke down into collected groups of service. So the one thing they said is called acts of service. Acts of service would be administrative service, silva service, community service, customer service, table service, domestic service, fan service, military service, public services, selfless service, and service of process. All of those fall under the acts of service. Then it went to religion. It said church service, divine service, service for music or service of worship. Then it went to economics and business. Service of economics, the non-material equivalent of a good in economics and marketing with the service product continuum. Service economy, which increases the integration of services in other sectors of the economy. I sound like a lawyer now. Service system or customer service, service design, service management, service marketing, service contracts, building services, engineering, service providers, communication networks, telecommunications, broadcasting, internet service, managed services, application service provided, storage service, hosted services, blah, blah, blah. Then it went to technology. The service system, you know, the servers, all the computers are connected to a server in a large organization. The internet is nothing but a bunch of servers all connected together. Local implementation of software, the computer software, Windows service, service menu, service mode, telecommunications, telecommunication services, which is the web services, the internet, chat services, value added on services including the IN, which is Intelligent Network, Web Hosting Services, Service as a Software Service. Then you have other services, which is just um, where it says service, the mechanic, electrician, structural, tennis, motor vehicle, service of process, servicing a tree, a service tree, which actually is a species of a tree, which I did not know. That made me think of the Eddie Murphy movie, A Thousand Words. That tree, I wonder if that was a service tree. <laughs> And then there's actually a high school in Anchorage, Alaska called Service High School. 
<laughs> I found that really funny. <laughs> like, I wonder what they teach there. Do they walk around in butler uniforms with a little platter, <laughs> a little napkin over their arm? How may I serve you? <laughs> so there's a lot of service. When I first came up with the idea of service, I really didn't think I was going to find as much to connect it to ways of service, and I was quite surprised to see. Then I started thinking, all right, if there's so much service around, why don't we have well, if Gandhi's right, over our own happiness in a world at large of happiness, why is our world not happy if there's so much service around? If there's so much service available, why aren't we in a state of bliss at all times? Why aren't our countries in a state of bliss? Is that me? <clears throat> I won't move. So what I um, wrote down was, it would appear that a quote by Gandhi is accurate. Everyone renders some service, some form of service. Now, I wonder how many of us actually do this deliberately, and what happens to those who begrudge service? Because there are people who get uh, upset. For instance, if you're, um, I don't know, uh, have a ticket, and the judge orders you community service, how many people get upset with that? I mean, you either have a, ju a chance to go to jail or to have community service. And even having the idea of community service, they're not doing it with their heart. It's like, have to do this, yeah. and so there's upset. Of course, we can go to the popular Lindsay Lohan. How many times has she been given community service and never shows up? Or that one time she was supposed to go to the morgue and help people and she got lost in the hospital, apparently lost for three hours in the hospital and missed her community service. So even though we're given the opportunity for service to get out of a consequence, we chose not to do it. We get upset about it. I remember when, um, it was either Ava Gabor or Zsa, Zsa Gabor, one of the Gabors slapped a cop. Does anybody remember this? It's gotta be about 15, 20 years ago. She got pulled over for a ticket, was so upset, don't you know who I am? Smack! Just smacks the cop in the face. I mean, just the audacity of some of the celebrities. So she was ordered to do, I think it was like 30 hours of community service, and she appealed and appealed and appealed because Ava Gabor does not do community service. I mean, it was this big to do, and she finally succumbed to it. I don't remember what she did. I think the lawyer kind of arranged it so it was a hidden, so nobody knew she was actually doing it. But I was really struck by the idea, first of all, the audacity of striking someone in the face, and then especially a police officer who's doing his job because she was speeding and so having so anger to smack somebody, and then the resistance of actually being of service. When I think about service, the uh, two things that actually came to mind was customer service. Now, customer service, when it first came to play, it really was a product of a company wanting to take care of the, the patrons to ensure that they continue back. For example, a tip. Originally, the tips were paid before the meal, because what it stands for is to ensure promptness. So you would pay a tip before you sat down to ensure that your meal would be taken care of and you would have promptness and you would have a good table. Then eventually it turned into, at the end of a meal, we rate the performance of the server. So it's not even a contribution anymore, and it even turns into uh, resentment, where people, oh, you don't give me a dollar. Even though they were the nastiest waitress or waiter, they expect to have 15%, and there are some restaurants that, whether you want to or not, they put a 15% gratuity on there to ensure that their waiters and waitresses get a tip. Because in the customer service realm, I believe this is the only industry that is still below the, um, what's the minimum, minimum wage. They still pay below minimum wage because they say you're going to get tips. So they get taken advantage of. And that's what I think has happened. In today's society, a service oriented field seems to be taken advantage of and that's why there's so many gripes about it. Well, um, that was an assumption from my perspective, the way I see it. So when I think about customer service, I thought, well, you know, every company has customer service department. Every website, you can just go on there and look for customer service. Sometimes they're hidden, but you have to find the customer service. And sometimes it's not a phone number. You can't actually talk to a person. You have to send in an email, and then they send it back, and you're having a chat with who knows who. Or eventually, if you end up getting customer service, it is someone from India who does not understand English and tells you words that you do not get. And you're, what? And then half the time, it's like, what? 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 Because you can't hear them because the static that's going through. Sorry, that was a gripe, wasn't it? Anyway, that was my experience of customer service one day <coughs> with Microsoft. <coughs> that's why I'm an Apple person. But I had a recent experience 
with a bill. I got this bill in the mail and it said I owed like $200 on my car payment, my truck. And I thought, well, I know I pay every month. Like, what, it, what are you talking about? So I went through and sure, you know, February, January, December, November, I paid. So I went back four months. I don't get this. Why, why am I keep getting this bill? Well, the bill says, you know, if you don't pay $200, we're sending you to the creditors and the collection agency. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I've been paying. Why are you sending me to a collection agency? So I called up the woman. Not a very nice woman. <laughs> so I'm aware that I'm calling a collection, somebody in the collection department of this bill. And I always overpay my bill. Car payments, I've always tried to double my bill so that it'll go down. So I know I've been paying more than what is required. So there's got to be some extra somewhere in case I did miss a payment. Like, why wasn't that paid forward? But, you know, I call with an clear mind saying, all right, you know, what can I do? Well, this woman was not a very nice woman. She answers the phone. What's your number? What's your account? I'm like, well, good morning. <laughs> How are you? And I gave her the account number. And then I started to say, I'm a little concerned. I don't understand why I'm being sent to. Well, let me just look at your account. Like, I wasn't even allowed to finish my sentence. And I thought, OK. She must be used to people who bark at her all the time. All right, I won't react to her. Well, then she pulls it up and says, you have $200 balance due. And if you don't pay it, we're going to send it to the collections. And I said, yes, I know. That's what the letter says. I'm curious, why do I have $200? Well, you just have $200. And then she starts going into what I can only assume is a script of what they're supposed to read when you're dealing with someone. So she gets to a point saying about missing payments. And then I said, but I haven't missed any payments. I'm, I'm, that's my point. And she um, I didn't even get to finish my sentence. Loud. Let me finish! I almost like, okay. <laughs> put the phone down, put it on speaker, and let her rant through her script. And obviously, the script did not pertain to me. Because she's going on and on. If I don't make a payment, it's going to be sent to collections. They'll repossess my vehicle. And I'm like, all right, I've had this truck for five years. I've never missed a payment. You're going to repossess because I owe $200, and I don't even understand why I owe you $200. So I let her go through her script. And finally, she says, when do you expect to make a payment? And I said, well, I'm curious. Why do I owe $200? Well, I just told her. And I said, no, no, no. You don't need to read that again. What I want to know is I, I'm looking at my bank statements. I have a withdrawal every month. Why am I owing you $200? Well, let me see. What's your account number again? <laughs> I was like, did you lose the screen? <laughs> so she went through and, well, here's December. Here's November. Here's... Oh, well, okay. And then she goes, October! You missed October! And she was so excited that she found it. And I went, okay, well, and I went through my bank and I said, you know, you're right, October, I did. I don't see that it was here. That's when I was switching bank accounts, so I must have missed it. Thank you so much for finding that. When are you going to make the payment? Okay, well, I can make it right now. Well, you need to make it by Friday, because if you don't make it by Friday, we're going to send it to... And I let her go through her speech, and I said, well, I'll make it right now. But you need to guarantee that you're going to have this in by Friday. And I, I thought, this woman hasn't even heard me. And I just very calmly said, as soon as I hang up the phone, I will make my payment. Well, how much are you going to make? You need to make $200 a month. And I said, well, if I make my $450 payment and add the $200, does that come to $650? Is that correct? Yes, that's what you need to pay. OK, well, I will make my payment as soon as I hang up the phone. You need to guarantee that I'm going to send you an email, and you have to guarantee. I mean, I was like, oh my goodness gracious, this poor woman must be really having a hard day. So I let her go through her speech again. And then I, and then she said, when will you make your payment? <laughs> and I was like, you got to be kidding me. So I very calmly said, have a nice day. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know what else to do. I said, I will make my payment as soon as I hang up my phone. Have a nice day. And just hung up, because I figured we were just going to go round and round and round. Sure enough, within two minutes, I got an email. You need to make your payment, or this is going to be sent to the collection agency, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, oh my goodness gracious, this is what customer service has gotten down to. We're, we're okay, I can understand that. But then I have positive customer service. Those of you who know, I love Starbucks. So when I go to my regular Starbucks, I'm always greeted with a friendly face, people who recognize me. How are you this morning? How is it going? What are you doing? Or if I have Mark's kids in the car, oh, you know, how's the kids? Do you want to drink for them? No, no coffee for the kids. You know, we do a little roundabout. And so that's a nice service. Although one time, uh, I want to say maybe two weeks ago, we went to the Starbucks and it was a different woman at the window. So Jenna always orders, I don't know, 
um, a raspberry iced tea lemonade is how it is. A raspberry iced tea lemonade, and then I get my typical drink. When we get there, my drink wasn't made with soy milk, because I always check, and it wasn't made with soy milk. So I said, is this with soy? No, you didn't ask for soy. Oh, really? I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you please make it with soy? So she takes it, and then they didn't put any lemonade in Jenna's tea. She's like, there's no lemonade in this. And, I, and so we go to the woman, she goes, oh, well, passion berry tea, and starts giving this description of what passion berry tea is. And I sit there and I think, okay, she doesn't know who we are. We order this every time I bring her to school. We stop and get one of these. Okay, I let her go through her speech, and then I just say, do you think you could just put some lemonade in for me? Well, I have to dump some tea out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay with that and then she kind of went okay and then walked away well then one of the other servers who typically sees me came by and saw me she went oh is your drink wrong and I said no they just forgot the lemonade in her drink and my drink wasn't made with soy milk and she just stepped right in and took over so I thought okay well customer service seems like you get good, good customer service if the people know you but you should have good customer service even if they don't know you so I went back home and I thought, you know, I never really do this, but I think I'm going to put a complaint in. Just because I thought, you know, I didn't need to have this woman. And I think they should know that customer service is being different at the company. So I wrote this. I tried to be polite. I just pretty much said, you know, I go to this place all the time. People know me. And I got this woman who didn't know me. And her customer service wasn't. And here's what happened. And I just feel like everyone should be equally treated, even whether, regardless if you know somebody or not. Within 10 minutes, I got a response back. They bought me two new drinks. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. We'll take care of it. And of course, I didn't want anybody to get in trouble, but that was a good risk for me because I usually never complain. So I decided to take that as a risk to complain to Starbucks. I got two free drinks out of that. I, was, I didn't expect that. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> so what I became aware of is customer service is, um, what's the word? It's uh, orientated to... Uh, likes and dislikes. If you like a person, you go out of your way for them. If you don't like a person, you do the middle. I was working with a client today. He said a very funny sentence. He said, there are some people who put in the eight hours and then they skate. It's eight and skate. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's actually very accurate. There are some people put in the time and that's it. They're done. They don't want to do second mile service. Second mile. I'm sorry, I'm trying not to move. They don't want to do second mile. They're just there to get the paycheck. And it doesn't matter to them. They could care less whether or not you are asking them to stay later or not. Nope, they're going to go. And I thought, okay, that makes sense, too. There are some people that really aren't concerned about the company or the overall. They just want their paycheck. Not right or wrong, but you can definitely tell the difference. This distinguishing the difference between the amount or the quality of work from these individuals. So that was one thing. Then my next thought was the United States Postal Service. Now, I just happen to have a friend who works for the post office, so... Every time I talk to her, all she does is complain about her job. And I understand. I mean, there's cutbacks. She's expected to do twice her route with less time, has to spend all this extra. She goes into work at 5.30 in the morning, sometimes doesn't get home until 6 or 7 at night. They expect her to work six days a week, don't pay her overtime. It's the salary thing. So I understand the disgruntledness with her, with the post office. So I have a little insider to the post office. But what made me think about the post office was, do you remember when going postal <laughs> was a phrase? That was slang. It still is today when somebody goes postal. What does it mean? Explode. They explode. And now that's a polite way of saying it. Sometimes going postal means you cause injury and harm and just kill. Just you get to a point where boom, and it's rage. So the definition here, this was funny. Not funny, but this is what it came to. Going postal is an American English slang, which means becoming extremely and uncontrollably angry, often to the point of violence, and usually in a workplace environment. So you let it build, let it build, let it build, let it build, and then, boom, you explode. The expression derives from a series of incidents from 1983 onward in which the United States Postal Service workers shot and killed managers, fellow workers, members of the police, and or the general public in acts of a mass murder. In 1986, between 1986 and 1997, more than 40 people were gunned down by spree killers in at least 20 incidences at the workplace. So that 40 is a large number. I mean, compared to a lot of the mass killings that have been going on, it may not seem a lot, but that's a lot of people upset going in and just killing people at work because they're so upset or disgruntled. 
And I know that this isn't, it's not just limited to the post office. There are people in any um, organization that'll just get up so upset. You know, that's not the first time. Of course, unfortunately, thinking of Sandy Hook, there's a gentleman who went postal. His mom didn't love him anymore, so he took it out on kindergartners, of all people. So these are, he, although he wasn't in a service field, but he did kill his mom, who was in a service field. Teachers, those are service, and teachers have one of the lowest paying incomes of all the people, uh, all the occupations, which is unfortunate. These are the ones who pretty much are taking care of the next generation, and they get paid such a nominal fee. And then, you know, George always used to say, it's funny how the football players and the musicians and the Hollywood celebrities make so much money when the occupations that really count really don't hardly make any money at all. It's just a good statement of our society. So when I thought about these two situations, the customer service and the postal, thank God I've never had a postal experience, but I have seen people go postal. And of course, I told you my friend who works at a post office, every time I talk to her, this, all she do is complain about her job. I thought if that's, it might be relevant that people who are in service-oriented jobs are now being taken advantage of. And so that's when they have resistance, they have um, begrudging, they're not happy, their life, there's no joy in their life. It's mostly feeling uh, taken advantage of and used. <clears throat> I had a friend of mine who uh, owned a restaurant up in Sedona, and she said it was really hard to keep the waiters and waitresses there because they had such an air about themselves. They expected that people should be grateful that they were serving them, and if they weren't, they just walked out. Like in the middle of the shift, they just get up and walk out. So she'd have a hard time keeping the servers in Sedona. She always used to blame it on the New Age crystals. <laughs> She'd say the New Age is affecting her <laughs> business up there. <laughs> so when, when I was thinking about service, of course, when I went back to the idea of what I wrote in the work, in the hand announcement, that, you know, the gas stations. There was a day, I remember this, there would be a day you pull into the gas station, the guy would come out, he'd wash the windows for you, open up the hood, check the oil, do the tires even if you wanted to, plus pump the fuel. I remember, that was like, you know, it was a, a treat to go to the car, the service station. Or even, um, I think Sonic still does this, but where the waiters and waiters will come out to the cars, so for the drive throughs they'd actually come out to the car and service you there. And then, of course, <clears throat> when you would go to um, hotels, every hotel had a doorman, a bellman, and an elevator. There'd be a dude in the elevator who'd run and operate the elevator for you so you wouldn't have to do anything. A concierge would be there to suggest meals for you. The maitre d' would, I mean, not the maitre d', the dude at the front desk, call and check on you, make sure everything's okay, up to your satisfaction. They hardly have that, excuse me, they hardly have that nowadays. Um, and that made me think about a story by Walter Russell. Walter Russell, I love this story about this gentleman. He was born in May 19th in 1871 and died May 19th, 1963. He died on my birthday. So that's probably one of the reasons why I like him. I'm incarnated. Maybe not. So that's what I looked like in my last life. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny if we actually had pictures of what we did in our last life? <laughs> anyway, this was a phenomenal gentleman. Um, he went to school, dropped out of school at the age of 10, and went to work, and most of his knowledge was learned by experience. Phenomenal individual, sculptor, painter, humanitarian, became incredibly um, famous. And um, I want to just go to here's what he, this cute little story that he wrote. He gave the idea that you could um, be available to anything, anything's possible. So that's one of his philosophies. He learned at a really young age, and he didn't actually know how that he got this idea, but he knew that somewhere, if he just allowed the universe to unfold, it would unfold. So um, he told us one story about how, um, I don't want to tell you that one, that doesn't, but I'm going to go, for one summer, he took a job as a bellboy in one of the hotels. And the salary was only $8 a month. Can you believe that? $8 a month. But he was told that tips for the bellboys received about $100 in the season. So for the season, for the summer, he can make about $100, but it's only $8 a month. When the first tip was offered to him, something very deep down within him would not let him take it. He got nervous and he stammered and said, no thank you, and ran away. He, he didn't want to take the money. He went and hid, he said, he went and hid down in the cellar and tried to probe why the inner voice had spoken to him. And then he said suddenly he had a great vision. I'll be the only bellboy in existence who, ever, who never took a tip. And I'll be the best boy the world, the bellboy has ever seen. 
I'm sorry, I'll be the best bellboy the world has ever seen. I'll pledge myself to give the most joyful and cheerful service that ever a bellboy gave. So I won't take the extra money, but I'm going to give the extra effort. That's what he thought. So this is about service. At a very early age, this is what he thought about. Then he said, from that moment on, he responded to every request with <clears throat> the acclitzer, didn't that, with enthusiasm. <laughs> he ran his legs off for everybody. He got up at 5 o'clock in the morning to milk a cow for a baby that needed special care. He would um, not take any tips, and he said, when he was asked why he wouldn't take any tips, I receive a salary, and I love my work. That's all he said. I receive a salary, and I love my work. The guests were simply overwhelmed by him, and they began to invite him to dinner parties and yachting trips. But when the management found out, they said, mm -mm, our staff, the servants, are not allowed to mingle with the guests. And what happened after that went out, a lot of the guests said, if you don't let him mingle with us, we're not coming back. So here's this 15-year-old kid got to have all these wealthy individuals that are wanting him to spend time with them. So he discovered that what they did was they were willing to break a rule for him because he was willing to give. Really, that's truly what it was. He was willing to give. I really, this, he's got a, a lot of other really small, cute stories about him learning about service and really going the second mile. On that instance, Walter Russell said, service was more important than money when it comes to service. I also have this book, Alice Bailey. For those of you who have ever tried to read Alice Bailey, read the dictionary first, and then you can read it, or an encyclopedia, and then you'll be able to read her. She's a bit of a hard read. However, she has a book called Serving Humanity, and <clears throat> I'm just going to go to the line I'm trying not to move. I'm going to go to the section where it says, what is service? And I really liked this first line. Service can briefly be defined as the spontaneous effect of soul contacts. So when your soul contacts my soul, that's service. I thought, how sweet and beautiful and simple can that be? Which I was quite surprised because it's Alice Bailey. <laughs> She's supposed to be confusing. <laughs> but I thought that was a beautiful picture, that when my soul connects with your soul, that's service. And <clears throat> that was touching to me. And then she said, the urge to serve. When in terms of occult science, we are told to serve and obey, then we don't want to do it. So again, that goes back to the people who were ordered courts ordered community service. I don't want to do it because we're being told we have to. But if it comes from my own volition, I want to serve. Oh, then I'm, I can do it. So even if you, it's kind of like the child thing. If you tell the kid to clean the dishes, I don't want to do it. But if they decide they want to clean the dishes, then they'll do it. So you have to get them to feel like it was their decision to clean. So it's really about intention. So she says, services um, for awakening the heart center and obedience is equally potent, but many people because of the obedience refuse to follow She said little men understand what little men understand of the urge if the urge is to satisfy desire in basic urge of the form of the life of man as, as Essentially physical emotional mental desires the urge to serve is equally basic urge of the soul So the basic urge of man lower level is the desires Basic urge of the soul is service. That's what the, the soul craves. That's what the soul desires to be of service. Now, I know many of you have been in service um, arenas volunteering, and you understand that. You understand how your soul ignites when you're in a place of service. And the difference of when you're told to serve <laughs> rather than when you wish to serve. So when I thought about service, again, I connected it back to Alice Bailey. Who, just beautiful, the connection, the contact of two souls. That would be uh, service. So I've been yapping for quite a bit now. What I want to do is give you an opportunity to sit and talk, so find someone to chit chat with and talk to them about service. If service is something that's a part of your life, what are the rewards of service? What inspires you to serve? So have a conversation with someone. The lady probably don't know this, but I went to, go to um, Torquem. Uh, he has uh, some really good information. So Torquem uh, has service, is one of the virtues. For those of you who don't know, it's one of the virtues there. Um, his definition of service, well, he says, there are many measuring rods by which to evaluate a man. For example, his titles, his diplomas, his knowledge, his wealth, and so on. But the best measure that we can have 
is to measure a man by his service. He said, service is not an activity, it's a radiation of the soul. Any thought, any emotion, any action, when charged with love, beauty, goodness, or truth, becomes service. So that means any work that you do, if you charge it with love, beauty, goodness, and truth, then it becomes service. So you can be of service filling up your gas tank. <laughs> you can be of service buying groceries. You can be of service in your job. When you go in and clock in or clock out, you can be of service as long as you have the thought or emotion of love, beauty, goodness, and truth. He said there are five steps that can be taken to lead a man into service. The first step is to select a need that is not personal or self-serving. So it's got to be a, so a need that doesn't serve you. That would be the first step. The second step is that you have to make preparations to meet the need, whatever it is, physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual. You must examine the need and consider ways and, and means to meet it. The next one, third step, is an in response to the need. It's the first urge to do something for someone else. The fourth step is meditating on the divine soul or virtues. For example, meditating on goodness, beauty, simplicity, and so forth. And the fifth step is to actually perform the service as a result of the inner radiation, but to prepare yourself to serve. Now, I mean the connection here to Omega, how those people who come in through the doors and are so moved that they wish to be of service here. And we always have a step. You don't just walk right in and start staffing. There's things that you have to do. To be of service, one of the first things we do is ask you to volunteer, to show up so we see who you are. That's the first step. So the idea of wanting to serve, what we do is go through a purification to make sure that your service is true and pure. That it's not just because you're excited and you're high and you want to be on that fire and just want to be here anytime the doors are open, but to see that you really understand what's required to serve. So many times we have you start at the bottom. Every facilitator here start at the bottom. We've all cleaned toilets. We've all done registration and parking. We've all answered phones. Well, many of us have answered the phones. So we start there. No, no task is beneath an individual. <clears throat> it's one thing I remember, a George, a George, about George. No task is beneath any individual. If you were in the art of service, you would be able to serve no matter what is requested. I remember when he would told the story of um, one of his teachers who was an engineer, and he went to a company applying for a job, and the HR gentleman was a bit pissy, for lack of a better word, and said to him, well, we have two positions open, a janitor and engineer, which do you want? And the gentleman said, well, which do you need? And so the HR thought, well, fine, I'll just give you this janitor job. He said, okay, I'll take it. And this was a, a brilliant gentleman. I'm struggling to remember his name. I'm waiting for it to come to me. But he was a brilliant gentleman. So within a week, as the janitor, um, it was in a machine shop, so there was lots of metal scraps everywhere. Within a week, he had constructed a belt that would collect all the scraps off the machine and dump them into a bucket. So just about once an hour, all he had to do was empty the bucket. So he'd sit there and just read while the machine was doing his job. So of course, within a week, he was promoted to engineer, but he didn't care. He was like, wherever you want me to do. You want me to be a janitor? I'll be the best janitor you need. Nothing was beneath him. That really is the art of service. <coughs> Excuse me. And as I was stating here back in Omega, a lot of people want to be here. There are some people because they like the glory. They want the center of the room. They want the attention. They want people to come to them. They want to be able to deal out advice. They want to collect clients. That's why we're very cautious about the individuals that we put in the classroom. So we start, nothing is beneath you. Everything is available to be of service. With that said, the idea of service, it's a radiation of my soul, and of course with Alice Bailey connecting it, that it's contact, of soul contact, which I think is a beautiful picture. I started thinking about intention of service. Because everything is fueled with intention. So if my intention is tainted or malice, what type of service will I provide? Uh, and I, I, I backed up for a second. I thought about the ways that you can connect love with intention. So if you have the intention when you say I love you that your intention is having sex, the experience is going to be shallow if it happens at all. Because you're saying I love you, but it doesn't match the vibration of love. If you're saying I love you with the intention of possessing another individual, well, most of the time you're going to have a turbulent relationship. 
If you say, I love you with the intention of manipulation and control, you will tire of the one that you actually conquered and then want to move on to somebody else. So there's, uh, move on to another prey, as a matter of fact. All of that has to do with intention. Of course, if you say intention, if the intention of I love you is an expression of your soul and sharing with another individual, most likely you'll have a connection if it's pure. But if you have any other ill intentions or malice, it taints the love or the energy. And I thought, well, that's got to be true with service of anything that we do, whatever intention it is, it's going to fuel the energy that's projected from us. So if I fill my service with the intention of, what if my intention is a paycheck? The intention of service is just the paycheck. Well, I'm going to be one of those people who is going to complain about the company. I don't really care about the company. I don't think about the big picture. It's just my job. That's it. I'm in and out. Or if my intention is greed, what would the outcome be? If my intention is ego-driven, what's the outcome? If my intention is malice and service, what is the outcome? So actually what I wanted to do is have you continue chatting with your buddies about those questions. If the intention of service is anything other than pure, what is the outcome? So if you've ever had any experience of that, where the intention was not pure, or, and I think this is also where being taken advantage falls into play as well. So just have a conversation. The questions again were, if the intention is greed, what's the outcome? If the intention is ego-driven, what's the outcome? If the intention is malice, what's the outcome? So talk to your buddies. Because you think that. about this, it's almost how we train our children. Joseph, Mark's son, 10 years old. Love this boy, sweetheart, but the biggest negotiator I've ever seen in my life. 10 years old. Everything that occurs, it's always about him. What can he get? How can he manage it? And how can he get more? Truly, this is how he is. It's, a, it's not adorable. It's annoying. <laughs> so it would be things like, if I have $5, oh, can I have your $5? No, it's my $5. But I want to get this book. Well, honey, I know you love books because he loves books. He loves to read, so his parents encourage him to read, and unfortunately they... I think he got 22 books for Christmas, and that still wasn't enough. <laughs> Susan gave him a gift certificate to um, Borders, and he spent all of that on more books. I mean, it was just, you've got to be kidding me. This kid, I really think he has a hoarder problem, <laughs> which I made him watch the show Hoarders just so he got the idea. And when it was over, he looked at me and he goes, well, do you think I'm hoarding books? And I said, I don't know, honey, what do you think? Well, I have a lot of books. Yeah, you do. <laughs> How many have you read them? Well, there's some I reread, but I also know he has books that he hasn't read. And since I've been in his life, he's seen how I get rid of things that I'm not doing. I'm not using anymore. I get rid of them. George taught me a long time ago, every six months, go through your closet, get rid of things you haven't worn, let somebody else use them. And of course, combining our households, he's seen, all right, we don't need this. We don't need two of each. Let's just get rid of them. So he's been around that. But still, the biggest negotiator. And unfortunately, because I'm not the official parent, although I have the discipline. <laughs> He'll do things, for, can I have 25 cents if I do a good deed? What? If I open your door, can I get 25 cents? Because Mark always opens my door. So he raises Mark to get my door. Can I have a quarter now? No, I'm not gonna give you, but the idea of an allowance. If I clean my dishes, can I have more money? If I do this, can I get 50 cents more? If I do Jenna's job, can I get another 50 cents? Like, it, it's always about him. But you know, he is a businessman. His kid is gonna be a marketer, I swear. <laughs> But I'm struggling with how do I teach him allowance and service? There's a fine line. We want to teach them that, yes, there's a reward for helping and cleaning, but you should also want to do something because of your heart, because it feels good that, to be of service. So I'm in, the, I'm in the line right now of how do I teach this child that, yes, there is a reward for your labor, but there's also a reward for your soul. And he doesn't, how does he understand a soul? Like, how does he understand that? So he's been around here long enough to know that yeah. I'm somebody important, but he doesn't really know why. And he knows that people are volunteers, but he doesn't get the concept of why we're here. But when we're here, he jumps in and wants to stack chairs with everybody. He wants to participate, help clean things. What can I do? What can I do? So when we're here, look, I'm getting an eye thing, so I must stop talking about him. <laughs> when we're here, he understands service. But when I'm not here, when we're home, he doesn't get service. So it's almost like he connects service to a location rather than um, a life, a way of living. So I've been approaching the subject of giving his books to the less fortunate. 
if he's read a book two, three, four times, give it to the less fortunate. I even suggested for him to give away his favorite book. That didn't go over very well. <laughs> he's 10. I got it. He's 10. But I figure if I start now, maybe 10 years from now, maybe five years from now, he'll get the idea of service. So again, it's a fine line. We teach people there's a reward for labor. So people think, well, why should I do something for free if I can have money? And this actually struck me. My daughter, my oldest daughter, Miranda's oldest, um, George's oldest granddaughter is Miranda. So I met her when she was 13. She staffed for me the teen trainings. W was a great staff member. But then as she got older and got into the workforce and then her daughter, her children were born and then her daughter started coming to the teen program, she made a comment which I couldn't believe. She said, I would never do anything without getting paid for it. And I was, what are you talking about? You, you staffed for me for years. Oh, well, I was young. Literally, that was her answer. I was young. And I'm like, okay then. <laughs> Thanks, honey. <laughs> Mackenzie, come here. Let me show you this. And then, you know, I start with the next generation. But it truly blew me away that once she had a taste of the workforce and getting paid for something, uh, volunteer is ridiculous. You shouldn't do that. You should always get paid for your efforts. I don't know where that came from. And I think what happens is people are drawn to a life of service or not. So if you're drawn to a life of service, it makes sense. If you're not drawn to a life of service, it's ridiculous. It, you should, that you're focused on the labor. That, not right or wrong. And I, I'm aware not everybody is drawn to a life of service. Not everybody can be committed. I think about George, very committed man, to service. Every day, all he thought about was work, work, work. Even those of you who heard the stories, when he was the first surgery he had, he woke up from anesthesia. His first statement was, I have to make a contribution to the citizens of this community, and went right back to sleep. <laughs> Susan and I looked at each other and go, <laughs> we should have recorded that. <laughs> it really was funny. It, like this, out of nowhere, just opens his eyes. I love you. Thank you for being here. I had to make a contribution to the citizens of our community. Sorry, you probably didn't get that. Apparently, I'm not making a contribution to the citizens of this community. <laughs> but that was on his mind all the time, making, making a contribution to wherever he went. So some people have service oriented and some people are not service oriented. Not right or wrong. I thought about um, if we were to fuel our um, service with, from a spiritual level, so what if my intention was sacrifice? What would the outcome be? If my intention of service was universality, or discipline, or conscious suffering, what would the outcome be? Or even humility. So talk to your buddies about the, dif the distinction there. If your service was fueled with a higher path, a higher way of being, um, uh, discipline, sacrifice, conscious suffering, or humility, how would it show up? So have a quick conversation with your buddy. I had a friend of mine who was blind, and she had a service dog. And Thinking about service dogs, most of them are German Shepherds or Golden Retrievers. If you know anything about a Golden Retriever, they are just like the most playful dog that you can ever imagine. Mark has a Golden Retriever. Just playful, runs around, just happy, loves to run, loves to catch. And if you think about it, as a service dog, now I don't know if a dog actually made a conscious decision that I'm not going to be a regular dog, I'm now going to serve and take care of this human being, be their eyes, but that's really what a service dog does. It gives up. It's typical running around and playing to stand by its master and make sure it crosses the street correctly, make sure that no harm comes to um, its master, the master, the human, its human counterpart, let's say. Uh, even police dogs do the same thing. They're very committed. They're very loyal partners. Um, I would actually prefer to have a dog as a partner. <laughs> if I was a policeman, I guess that's what I should have added that. If I was a policeman, because they're loyal, they're dedicated, they're not going to complain about anything. <laughs> but if you think about it, that's what the dogs do. They, they don't have the regular life of a dog, but they're committed to serving. And back in Egypt, um, the days of Egypt, what they had was uh, the cats would be the service. They stayed in the palace and the cats would warn the dogs if there was an intruder. So it was the cats that actually had the responsibility of protector and that so they would alarm the dogs and then the dogs would alarm the army, whatnot, because the cats obviously weren't loud enough, but the cats were really highly revered in the Egyptian era for service. And that's what we say, man's best friend, the dogs serve its master. That's one of the things that is often connected with um, animals. 
So when, back to the idea of service, if we fuel service, I was thinking I had my um, two, uh, two of my grandchildren over this weekend. So Abby is now seven and uh, Lori is 13 and a half and a quarter according to her. <laughs> so Lori is the one who has uh, the mental retardation issues. So she's a little slow. And as soon as they got in the car, the first thing they said, oh, I gave up candy for Lent, and I gave up pop for Lent, and then, Anne Marie, what did you give up? I'm like, Lent? Was this this week? <laughs> oh, goodness gracious, Lent. <laughs> but because I was thinking about service, I already thought, wow, that's conscious suffering right there. That even in the um, dogma of the Catholic religion, you give up something for a period of time. That's conscious suffering. That would be service, to, be, to cleanse, purify. I can't quite remember why we do the Lent, but... It's there. <laughs> I've drifted so far away from the church. I just know that it's Lent. I didn't know it was this time, though. It really did catch me by surprise and caught me off guard. And then I debated whether or not I should lie to them uh, that I gave something. So then I just said, I gave up meat because I'm a vegetarian and I don't eat meat. So that worked. <laughs> so I didn't intentionally give up meat, but I did give up meat. So it's working. I didn't lie, but I didn't really tell the truth. <laughs> I guess I could have just said, I don't really practice Lent. But um, anyway, I thought it was intriguing that here's the young generation, this is what they're thinking about for service. Um, so then what I started thinking about was conscious service. So we said conscious suffering, but what about conscious service? When I consciously <coughs> intend to serve, then, then what I connected this with is happiness or joy. Now, because I've spent much of my life in the nonprofit realm, I'm aware of the amount of joy that you experience from service. I watch it in people when they come to serve and how they just get ignited and so inspired and they're on fire because they're in service. You see it in the kids when you have kids helping you serve. They're so excited. They just want to do more. So there's something about service that draws out the joy. <clears throat> then what I think I thought about was back to Gandhi's quote that every one of us does some, does some form of service to one another. So whoever stands before you, you have an opportunity to be of service. And it made me think of um, those little books, uh, Random Acts of Kindness, but it was the little handbooks, of, and they give you the little one-liners of things that you can do, like uh, let somebody get on the freeway before you, or park in the furthest parking spot so somebody else has the close spots, or picking up the trash. So those are little random acts of kindness, and those actually do um, bring joy, but it is service as well. Uh, George always had the idea that make a place cleaner than when you first found it. So clean the public restrooms, go to the park, pick up the dog poop, if you're daring enough to do that. But making a place better is for somebody else, not just for you. And then I thought about, you know, have, what's the difference of when you fuel your actions with joy? Um, I know that for me, when I consciously serve, I experience joy, time goes by faster, I enjoy whatever action or I'm involved in, and I feel lighter when it's over. And you have a deeper connection with individuals when you fuel it with joy. And then I thought about the times you've probably experienced me coming with a migraine. When I'm up here and I just barely can get through it, and all I can do is just focus on the next word, the next word. I'm not filled with joy, and my deliveries are not fulfilling, I think. They're flat. So there's a difference between showing up with joy and not with joy. Even though I'm here, still committed, I know I'm being affected by the physical, um, I want to say injury, but it's not really an injury, annoyance. <laughs> it's a physical annoyance, pain, pain would work, uh, which is affecting my service. Now, what I thought about, obviously, the random acts of kindness, um, and I was going to have you talk to your buddy about the last time that you actually shared joy, but I want to share something with you. I was talking to Mark today. He's over in Kansas City on business, and he said, you're not going to believe this. And he picked up this laminated card. He actually he took a photo of it and sent it to me. He said, this is posted in the hotel. This is posted in the hotel room. It says, in ancient times, there was a prayer for the stranger within our gates. Has anybody heard this? This completely blew me away. Because this hotel is a human institution to serve people and not solely a money-making organization, we hope that God will grant you peace and rest while you are under our roof. May this room and hotel be your second home. 
May those you love be near you in thoughts and dreams. Even though we may not get to know you, we hope that you will be comfortable and happy as if you were in your own house. May the business that brought you our way prosper. May every call you make and every message you receive add to your joy. When you leave, may your journey be safe. We are all travelers from birth till death. We travel between the eternities. May these days be pleasant for you, profitable for society, helpful for those you meet, and joy to those who know and love you best. This was in a hotel. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and again, because we're talking about service, he's like, I had to tell you this. I, and he had to send it. He's like, you need to use this tonight. I was really, really moved with the idea. And I, I love this line. Because we're in a human institution to serve people and not solely a money-making organization. That's a beautiful line. Now, of course, this is from ancient times, and naturally I went on Google and Googled it to see if there's been various, um, various, a variety of different ways that this is put together, but it still has the same consistency. And the major piece still talks about the idea of being of service to you and providing joy and may your business prosper. What a great way to run a hotel. I mean, what a great way to have people feel like you really do care about them. I mean, Mark read this, he's like, I have a totally new perspective for this hotel right now. I love this place. <laughs> Not that he did it before, but he really, it just shifted his perspective completely entirely. And when he read this to me, I was moved. I thought, holy mackerel, I can't believe an organization actually has that posted in their rooms. Every room has a laminate. It's laminated and posted right on the desk for everyone to see. Now there's a good example of a company who has not lost the art of service. A hotel is of service. Obviously they're making money, but they're also providing a service. So this is an organization, a company, that has not lost the art of service. They understand that they're providing a service to their guests and they're acknowledging them and wanting to um, assist you in your prosper and, and assist you in your business. So it's not about how much money can I make, it's what can we do for you. To me, that was a beautiful picture, a really good way of defining what service would be. So service doesn't mean you don't have to make money, but your intention would be to be of service to another individual. And if there's labor involved, money's exchanged. But if no labor is involved, you're still in service to another individual. I think it would be wonderful if all organizations could somehow rewrite this and work it into their organization that they would be of service to their customers. I remember, I know I've been talking about George a lot tonight. I'm sure it's because I'm tired and it's easy to just refer back to him, but this used to be his printing company. He was always in service to the client, always in service to his customers, never argued with them. Well, you know, you dealt with him. Never argued, never put up a fight. Just always in service. He was even in service to Doyle. How can I help you? Let's buy, let's make sure your equipment is getting used, whatnot. So anybody who had an interaction with him knew that he was about service. George was a very, um, service-oriented individual from the early years of when he was a pastor to obviously his final years here at Omega Vector. In um, some of his uh, boxes that I've acquired, <laughs> I found some old pictures of uh, him when he was building the church up in Page. And for those of you who may not know this, he was um, in Bible school here in Phoenix and in his fourth year he didn't finish his fourth year of Bible school. He actually was excelling in school, so the, I don't know, head dude, uh, requested him to go up to Page and build a church. If you've ever been to Page, you'll know there's a street. It's a row of churches. <laughs> George's is the very first church on that street. So uh, he was sent up there at a very early age, I want to say he was in his early 20s, to build this church. No money. I mean, he was a pastor, had uh, two kids, and then he had two kids more while they were up there. And his job was to try to raise money from these construction workers to build this church, because the church itself would give him money. And so anyway, he has pictures of the building in progress and whatnot. But what George did was phenomenal. He took on any job he could take to get money. He was the postmaster. He was the bus driver. He worked in the groceries, bagger and groceries. He didn't care. Whatever it took to get this church built is what he did. 
So he became very familiar with all the people in the town because he was doing all the jobs. Whatever they needed, he, he picked up chairs. Whatever you need, he did. He made himself available. And his church was the first one built. He raised enough money to have the whole thing put together and built. It was the first one that was completed up on that row, the church row. And he attracted a really good congregation. And he often laughs about this because within a year of him completing the church, he walked away from it because <laughs> he realized that wasn't the life for him. He, he couldn't believe in an organization that said, if you don't follow us, you're going to burn in a lake of fire through eternity. He couldn't believe a God would be that way. So he took a risk and walked away. But the idea of building the church is nothing was beneath George. Any job that he could get to pay the rent and to help build this church, that was his focus. And for those of you who also know George, most of the money he made went right back into Omega Vector. He died a, 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 a man in poverty, um, because I took care of him, I know. He died in poverty. Everything he had went to this organization. Everything he wrote went to this organization. The only book he published, he self-published. He couldn't put it out there on Amazon. He didn't. He published it himself, printed it himself, and sold it to Omega graduates. It was never about a profit. So his whole life went to an organization. And many times, if you look through history, you'll discover a lot of the teachers died poverty because it wasn't about the money. It was about the contribution. So I know that my study of the history of the teachers, many of the teachers were not famous until after they passed away. So I keep wondering, you know, when will George... <laughs> the name George Adair across the globe. <laughs> I'm sure it has now, but when, it, when will it become... Unfortunately, a teaching, I suppose, would be the correct word. And, you know, every teacher had their disciples, so it's up to us disciples to continue on with the work. And that's probably why I'm speaking about him a little bit more tonight. I don't want to forget his teachings. I mean, his, he's the foundation of Omega. And the foundation of everything that I know, I guess I would say, my teachings have all been based upon what he's taught me. So back to the concept of the art of service, the lost art of service. I think the best way that we can connect back to the art of service is if we go back to intention. What is my intention when I serve? If we go back to the idea of fueling my actions with love, with beauty, with goodness and truth, will that increase my service? And remembering that Alice Bailey said, it's not in the paper, but Alice Bailey said that a, the service is when two souls connect or have contact. I think that's a beautiful picture. So if we could go out there in the world tomorrow or the following week and see how our actions change, I was checking to see if my wire is gonna fall off, <laughs> how our actions change if we implement service. So I would charge you with the task of challenging yourself to charge your actions with service, no matter what you're doing, charge your actions with love, beauty, goodness, and truth, and come back in two weeks and tell us how it, it was, if you saw any difference. Did anything change for you? How's your demeanor? How's the demeanor of other individuals? So that's your task right now. If you choose to take this on, this message will disintegrate in 30 seconds. <laughs> well, that's all I have for this evening. Thank you so much for coming out. I hope you enjoyed it. We have two handouts for you. You have the handout, the Monday Night Workshop, and then I went ahead and printed the Stranger Within prayer for you. Oh, you. So if you wanted to take that with you as well. So thank you very much. We'll see you in two weeks. You are welcome. You're welcome.